Welcome. We would like to continue with the panel entitled Development Policies, Asymmetrical Trade Relations and Global Financial Systems. I'm very honored that I've been invited to um, chair this panel. I think it's a wonderful and really important conference. And I'm also happy to have assembled here a vast expertise and experience, not only in international economic law. You can't hear me? No? Uh, but is it my fault? Should I speak louder? OK. International economic law, international development finance, legal theory, ethnography of law, human rights law. So I think we will have a fruitful discussion. Um, just the briefest of introductions, and I might add some further biographical information later. So on the left, um, Celine Chan. Um, she's an associate professor of law at Warwick University in Great Britain. Um, next to her is sitting Obiora Shinedu Okafor, who is teaching law, who is professor of law at Osgood Hall Law School in Toronto, Canada. And to my right is Luis Eslava, uh, with a, uh, who is senior lecturer at Kent Law School in Great Britain. So what I would like to do, what the plan is for um, this panel and for the next one and a half hours, I would like to have a conversation on broadly four themes. One, the first, is post and neo-colonial qualities of today's international economic law, or maybe also more broadly international law. The second theme shall be utopian aspirations of the past and the present. The third, how to teach post-colonial international economic law. And the fourth theme, if we have time, should be on critical lawyers' engagements in resistance and reform. So we will be reconnecting to themes which have come up earlier today. So let's get started with the first theme, the diagnosis of the present of the imperial qualities of international economic law. And before I give the word to our panelists, I would like to start with a very brief observation on international economic law and its scholarship. So for a long time, international economic law has been a bit of an area for specialists, not at the center of attention of mainstream international lawyers. This has changed significantly in recent times, not least due to large-scale protests 1999 at Seattle and these days against the multi-regionals um, CETA or TTIP that the EU um, is negotiating. Um, so when today international economic lawyers like myself um, take a critical approach to international economic law, what we sometimes do is we um, tell a story of deterioration. And this story commonly then starts um, with a post-World War II economic order, the model of embedded liberalism, um, which was created in order to coordinate national economies through international law, while at the same time leaving states enough policy space to pursue, for example, policies of um, full employment, um, social redistribution. Um, but of course, what is missing in this narrative, oh, we start there and then we say um, the neoliberal economic order is taking over, policy space is being reduced, um, space for political self-determination, um, and politics is being colonized by economics. And what is missing in this story, obviously, is a post-colonial viewpoint. Um, with a common story of the model of embedded liberalism being replaced by a neoliberal economic order and of politics being colonized by economics, we neglect that embedded liberalism was not reality for the larger part of the world. Telling the story this way runs the danger of missing that post-war international economic law did not emerge out of the blue and not in reaction to trade wars of the interwar period, but that it has a much longer colonial history. So I'd like to invite us to now explore international economic law's colonial present. 
what are the imperial features of the current international economic law, which continuities exist with colonization, and how have imperial relations of exploitation be reconstituted, possibly in different legal forms. So I would like to um, start with you, Celine. You write and teach and act as an expert also in international economic law. You have a particular specialization in the law of development finance and also in international investment law. And in one of your articles you write, and I'd like to quote, the process of decolonization saw the rapid entry of previously peripheral countries into the global economic system, necessitating the reorganization of international economic law and governance to accommodate new postcolonial international relations, including, and now this is important, the maintenance of political influence and access by former imperial countries to resources and markets in the newly independent states. So, I would like to ask now, what is the contribution of international economic law in maintaining the influence of the former imperial powers and in securing their access to markets and um, natural resources? Hi. Thank you very much, Isabel. And um, again, thank you for, to all the, the organizers for organizing this uh, workshop and conference. Um, I want to return to this notion um, of the Eurocentricism of international law, which I, like Isabel, mentioned in the quote from my article, I, I look at it from the lens of international economic law and how that sort of uh, the creation of, of law, as, as Tony Anghi, who, by the way, uh, shaped a lot of my thoughts on, on and my work, so I, I owe an incredible um, intellectual debt to him. Um, in terms of the creation of, of, of um, international law in the image of the European um, uh, image and, and of, of what is a civilized nation and in this sense, what is a civilized international economic order. And I think that's very important when we look at how um, international law, um, economic law particularly has developed or not developed over the years. Um, and using this, um, I want to bring in um, something that probably Lewis would be familiar with, uh, you know, like the social legal scholars. So we have the Twail scholars who are also challenging, you know, the doctrinal perspective in international law. But there's also some of us who kind of straddle uh, that the Twail, but also the social legal, legal tradition, which looks at law not only in terms of the rules and the books, but also what the law means in terms of a signifier. So law as regulation, but also as legitimation. So law um, in itself presents uh, symbols and uh, the signifiers um, of uh, how we uh, will construct, how we understand uh, the nature of the world to be. And I think that international economic law has a function in that. So it, ha it in some ways, it, it, it um, creates the legal infrastructure. And I think Tony mentioned some of that, you know, the conceptions of property, who owns property, what is property rights as conceptualized as something that the law protects. So it will protect individual property rights rather than um, indigenous community rights. Um, intellectual property rights are framed in a particular way to grant, you know, certain entities rights, but not other um, uh, uh, community. So there's, there's that kind of reproduction of an order that is dominant and it's very Eurocentric. Um, but it's not just the law. I think this, a lot of these things are reinforced by mythologies of law, um, as it were, as Peter Fitzpatrick would say it. It's how law conceptualizes these terms as in it's an absolute and we all internalize that. I mean, you know, um, you all see these uh, adverts about uh, it's really bad to uh, copy um, stuff of the photocopier and it's really bad to, um, you know, like print uh, you know, stuff without authorization. Um, but then there is not the similar sort of advertisements of when multinational drug companies, for example, would appropriate the knowledge of indigenous peoples, develop a drug out of it, and then sell it for a profit, and that is absolutely fine because it's you know research development and that is their intellectual property, not the property of the people who have, you know, for example, developed that over the years. Or for example, when you develop a, um, uh, uh, and this happened during the case of the bird flu, where you develop a, um, uh, a vaccine for a particular medicine. 
which um, you take from uh, an exercise of, uh, you take it from the blood and, and you know, from, of, of the people in the South who have been part of these epidemics and that's collected from these people and that is being used in a repository to then fund private research into vaccinations which then are developed into vaccines which is then sold back to the South at very highly inflated prices but actually using the information from people and communities in the South um, to fund that uh, development that profit, but not acknowledging what their contributions to it. So law, in a way, that's law. In, in it's intellectual property rights. It's interactive. It's law, but it is also um, how it shapes our understanding. So pe we we think that's okay. You know that that's not a breach of intellectual property. Um, but if you um, you know, illegally copy a Hollywood movie, that's a breach of intellectual property. And, and, and that's, I think, you know, the problem in uh, the way that um, international law continues to be used, I think, um, in a sense that reproduces uh, the Eurocentricism of, of, of the colonial past. But maybe just a follow-up question. So if you should pinpoint those institutions or rules of international economic law which are most responsible for perpetuating or maybe even deepening global inequality, what would those be? So you mentioned international um, property, intellectual property law uh, as one of those bad regimes of international economic law. Well, I don't, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, going back to what Tony and um, I was saying earlier, I mean, it's not about just the, the, the you know, it, are we, international law in itself, I mean, it's problematic, um, but international economic law it, is, is a fairly new um, conception, right? I mean, in the history of international law. I think what has happened over the years, um, like for the law of foreign investment, for example, has developed into a very, very constraining field of international economic law. and that. Um, in a way guarantees um, access of foreign investment to developing countries. Um, it also allows um, uh, the protection of uh, foreign investment uh, when they are in developing countries. So there's two aspects to, to that. It's access to, so the liberalization aspect, and what we call non-discrimination, which you know, basically protects the rights of, you know, the foreign investor not to be discriminated within um, uh, uh, the countries that they operate in, but also to protect what is known as, you know, among other things, the legitimate expectations of the foreign investor when, when, when they go to, to the country. So the way that international investment treaties are designed now um, is that they tend to privilege uh, the foreign investor within within um, the, the the countries that what we call the host countries, mostly developing countries, because if you look at you know where the investors' uh, home states are, they tend to be from the Western industrial, like the former colonial powers, um, now no longer having colonial access to the resources, but they needed a way to enter the country legally. So what they do is they then sign these pretty much asymmetrical trade and investment relations so the law facilitates their access to rather than you know the colonial overt colonial um, aspects so they do i think investment law is 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 pretty much an uh, you know a framework but also international institutions um tony mentioned the uh, bretton woods institutions the world bank and the imf and pre this um uh, a proliferation of investment treaties, which has basically only happened in the last uh, 20, 25 years, right? Um, you had the groundwork being um, uh, set by the Bretton Woods institutions, um, who by virtue of being what we call the lender of last resort in terms of financing, right? They, that when countries um, cannot fund activities for whatever reason, a lot of it also has to do with unequal international economic law structures, for example, unequal terms of trade from trade agreements, et cetera, and, 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 and you know, structural problems within the economy, commodity dependence, et cetera, which is you know, primarily due to the historical uh, nature of, of the economy, but also um, you know, contemporary structures of trade, which uh, countries couldn't break out of. 
And as a consequence, reliance on financing from these international institutions also come with you know, conditionalities and conditions of lending. And so a lot, most of you will be familiar, um, Germany, with the Greek debt crisis, which also comes with a lot of conditions, right? So it's a similar thing in terms of developing countries. And they laid a lot of the groundwork, as in before there were trade and investment treaties, actually the World Bank and IMF conditionalities had already liberalized these markets through um, what is known as unilateral liberalization. There were conditions of loans and financing from uh, these institutions um, that opened up markets within developing countries to um, uh, foreigners um, and also instituted through um, significant legal reform in economic sectors such as mining and agriculture, um, land reform, all these, uh, so facilitated the legal reform of those countries' um, domestic economies prior to entry into this. So some, uh, the groundwork was already laid, and then, then the international law came in, then the international economic law came in, once those economies were already restructured internally through the advice, and this is the law and development movement that was, for, for, um, you know, um, uh, talked about. I think Louise and I come from a tradition that we hope is the more critical law and development movement, but um, there is, you know, the, the, the original law and development movement was this movement at the World Bank, initiated by the World Bank, to institute a lot of these legal reforms within countries um, to facilitate this kind of uh, extraction, natural resource extraction, access to markets. Um, and we are actually seeing um, at right now um, the new contemporary wave of that um, in a different form through the guise of meeting the sustainable development goals. So right now, there is a massive push um, at the international level to what I call privatized aid or privatized development because the sustainable development goals is used as a conduit for some uh, donor countries, um, a lot of uh, companies to say, well, we've got a very ambitious agenda to meet these development goals within developing countries. We haven't got enough money to meet all our commitments to reduce maternal mortality, you know, combat health epidemics, combat climate change, etc. We're going to need a lot more money. So the only way that we're going to need more money because of the austerity in the north is to encourage private companies to come in and give that money. And we're seeing this new wave of facilitating access by companies into developing countries through another guise, right? So we have different inroads, which I think is very, very problematic for um, uh, uh, developing countries. And, 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 you know, it, it facilitates this kinds of, it continues that colonial relationship. But I think one of the, 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 the myths, right, that is perpetuated um, through, and I said, you know, law is also a myth, but it depends on myths as well. It depends on um, some narratives and symbols of certain ideas of what we have. And one of this is great, um, conceptualization of it by Daniel Tarullo, who's a professor at Georgetown University right now, but he was a former member of the Federal Reserve Bank, right, during the Obama administration. Now, in a 1985 article, <laughs> pre his policy time, Daniel Tarullo um, talks about this thing called the myth of normalcy, right, which is applied to developing countries. Um, it's the adolescent myth that uh, fuels this kind of civilizing mission that we talk about, the Twale scholars talk about, um, that developing countries are seen as somehow not equal sovereigns in the international economic order because they're not so economically developed. So it's kind of like, you know, they're not normal. Um, uh, the normal conception of order is, you know, like Germany or the UK or some Western economy that's based on some sort of embedded liberalism as well in some ways, right? It's not like, you know, that that's the structure of, of um, society. Um, and what you have is this legitimation of international institutions, including development institutions, including international financial institutions, um, 
to intervene in countries. So we, we heard a lot about the interventions for humanitarian reasons and human rights reasons that's justified on the basis of, of this kind of like, you know, uh, difference between the developing developed world. But I think this myth of normalcy, the need to, uh, that there is a normal um, state of affairs in economic order, and it's very Eurocentric. Um, and developing countries who don't, because you don't stack up to that, countries in debt distress, for example, they're not normal, they're, you know, there's a crisis. So that means that the international community has a right to intervene, and it has a right to tell these countries what to do. Um, I mean, I come from a country that rejected the IMF in the Asian financial crisis. Um, and I think we were much better for it, right? I mean, if you looked at how um, my country did, in, uh, Malaysia did, in comparison to the countries in the, in the region in the post-Asian financial crisis, I mean, it was very much very clear, you know, how we could have that policy space that you talked about that was increasingly used. But we were lucky because, you know, we could do it. We, we, we were able to. Um, and I think this myth of normalcy allows the international community to go in. The SDGs, for example, allow for that discourse to be used to enter into countries to say, well, actually, we know what you know is good for you. It allows the IMF to say, you are not, you are not here. You want to get from here to here. Um, let's not for, let's forget about our contributions to your debt crisis. That you know, like we precipitated this issue. Um, through asymmetrical relations, through the financialization, through the unregulated global markets, financial markets, but that's fine. Um, you are now in crisis and we have to help you and you need our help, so we're gonna intervene. And that's legitimated by the international community, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that is a problem. Okay, so I think that's an important point also to point out that there might be more scope to resistance than is sometimes acknowledged, that you might refute aid by the international financial institutions, or maybe that you could also cancel your bilateral investment treaties as many, uh, many countries have been doing in recent times. But maybe sticking for a while to the critique of um, particularly international investment law and the international financial institutions, given all the disenchantment with these um, regimes of international law, Often a remedy called for is to strengthen human rights. So because what is often observed, and I think rightly so, is the asymmetry in enforcement mechanisms. You have a very strong enforcement mechanism, for example, in the WTO, but even a stronger one um, um, instituted by international investment law where investors get the procedural right to bring claims directly against states. So the question arises indeed, would things be helped if human rights were integrated into international investment treaties, if they were mainstreamed even better into the international financial institutions. So this brings me now to you, Obi, because you're not only a specialist in human rights, but you're also pointing out in your um, work the hegemonic dimensions of international human rights law and practice. So I'd like you to expand for us expand for us on this a bit uh, thank you so much i think uh, that uh, those who have come before me uh, especially uh, macau in particular uh, have said a lot of other stuff about human rights but i i think they bear uh, repetition uh, if if that's what uh, you find that i'm doing um, I, I think that one of the most fundamental things to keep in mind when we look at human rights and, and, and one of, you know, uh, not just Twill, but also sort of other critical internationalists, uh, lawyers, their contributions have been to show, sometimes in granular fashion, sometimes through more general, uh, general theory, uh, the ways in which human rights, including international uh, uh, human rights, can serve and indeed uh, have always served uh, both progressive uh, goals on the one hand and hegemonic or other regressive goals on the other hand, and sometimes in tandem, actually, making it much more difficult to unravel, right? So for example, a critique of the International Criminal Court often leads you to stairs. How can you criticize such a good thing, right? Uh, because there's, there's some 
progressive goals going on, there are progressive things going on that almost begin to mask the hegemonic things that go on at the same time. So even if sometimes they're not in tandem, sometimes they're sequential, sometimes they're not. Uh, I mean, uh, this is not necessarily original <laughs> to me, although I've, my work has contributed. Makar himself has made this point. Upendra Bakshi's work is noted in the book, The Future of Human Rights, in this respect. Uh, and so uh, the invocation of human rights can ground or justify uh, both insurrection, progressive insurrection, as well as a politics of domination. So when human rights is invoked, is not always for a good end. Just because you invoke human rights does not mean that your objective is good. And that's often the mistake that is often made in the literature and even by well-meaning activists, right? Uh, so for example, uh, uh, take the way in which the alt-right, the KKK, I like to call them, uh, invoke freedom of speech a lot in the US. Neo-Nazis in Europe have always or freedom of assembly, uh, as if it's this neutral thing that you know, uh, protects all kinds, all shades of politics, all shades of action, and all that. Um, uh, but this freedom, same freedom of assembly and freedom of speech also protects activists who work against dictators and draconian regimes all over the world, the Arab Spring, and so on. Right? So it is the same, uh, you know, Bakshi calls it separate and unequal shelter, right? So he shelters this politics of domination at the same time as he shelters uh, a, a, pol a progressive politics, or he can shelter a progressive politics. Uh, and, uh, but it's a separate uh, and unequal kind of sheltering that goes on. Uh, and so this is basic, is fundamental to understanding the Twill approach. If you start from that, that basis, um, okay, sorry. if you start from, 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 from sort of this premise, then you open up, as, as Macau has sort of uh, shown here, you open up human rights, uh, uh, your, sort of your human rights vision to all kinds of realizations. Um, uh, and then if you take that, uh, uh, parlay that uh, sort of on the, on the global scale, uh, you begin to see that just because human rights, and in particular, uh, to some extent, women's rights, for instance, was invoked as justification, as grounding for the invasion of Afghanistan, does not mean that that's why the US went to Afghanistan, right? It, it sounds basic to some, but when you look at the actual living human rights law, I'm interested in living human rights law, not human rights text, the way in which is represented on paper. But if you look at how human rights is actually performed, dramatized, represented, uh, and acted, you will see that most people take that for granted. You know, uh, that, 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 you know, uh, not most people, but many people, too many people, uh, uh, take it for granted that these invocations uh, uh, are made uh, 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 with, uh, with sort of progressive goals in mind. Uh, for democratization, for example, on the African continent, which most people would agree with. But oftentimes, the democratization agenda, again, masks a hegemonic economic and political uh, agenda uh, as well. Right? And so, PAP 12 often, what 12 work often does is try to, uh, if you like, compact in, uh, uh, in granular way to trace and follow uh, and also, uh, also show how these things have been continuous, right, over the long run. Uh, in many cases, in far too many cases, uh, from colonialism to the present, albeit in different ways in detail, right? So on the general level, you actually find that the techniques, the structures, and all that have not morphed or changed all that much. Um, and so you could be studying you know, I, I don't know what, what uh, Britain was doing in, in Nigeria in 1920s, 
and you could be studying what the IMF was doing, uh, sorry, it was doing in the 70s and 80s, and, and the structure, the general structure is amazingly similar. Of course, the details, the particular ways in which colonialism plays out, or neocolonialism plays out, is of course different. I'm part of what I, uh, uh, my sort of research agenda now, because I kind of wear two hats, uh, both as an academic and as someone who's involved in, in UN work, is to, is to almost be a participant observer to the more granular ways in which um, domination plays out. Um, and and <clears throat> so those are just two examples. Um, and this leads, leads me to uh, 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 speak about, uh, and this is, this is of course uh, uh, um, a point that Tony Yangi has made at length in his book, uh, uh, how our assertions of our common humanity, which often grounds human rights, right? Uh, we are all humans, and therefore, if we're all humans, we're entitled to these rights, and we're entitled to then have our rights uh, protected or advanced by people across the world in other, on other continents and so on. How historically, from colonial times, that's the very justification for empire. This is the structure of the argumentation, right? And that's why uh, we must be suspicious of invocations of human rights, not because they are always bad or have uh, bad objectives, but because they can have bad objectives. And that's why suspicion is a better uh, uh, stance or posture to have until the contrary is proven. Um, <coughs> now, just sort of switching a little, even going back to the very fact that the human rights language is now the sole approved language of resistance or protest, can be prob problematic, can exact transaction costs in, um, in the global south, at least in uh, many parts of the global south. Uh, 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 Rajagopal Balakrishnan's work uh, shows this to an extent. Uh, it subordinates and displaces other languages of protest. So there's an erasure that happens there. It's as if before human rights came, people in the global south never thought about how to protect their dignity, how to protest against domination. They had no language with which to express it, right? So even bringing human rights uncritically, the human rights language uncritically, without realizing that, in fact, you are going to displace Thinking that has gone on for thousands of years in many cases in many, can be problematic. And actually exact transaction cost to an activist, uh, the activist project of defending uh, the poor and the disenfranchised. Because take, for example, the language of duties. And, and here I, I take uh, Macau's work on duties, right, which I, I think is absolutely brilliant, um, which is spoken very widely uh, in, in, around the African continent duties to the young children, duties to aged parents. These say similar things as the human rights of, you know, elder, elders' rights or, or children not to be abused and things like that. But an activist will go to a village of people who've never heard about the UDH and they start telling them about the UDH. What you're doing is adding transaction costs, delaying, uh, perhaps Macau thinks indefinitely almost, the ability to root human rights in the, in, the, in the consciousness of the people. If you just told them about duties, they will understand what you're saying. Why speak to them in a language they don't understand, except that, that, that you want to perform this erasure of local agency, normalization of the denial of the agency uh, of people, the notion that thinking uh, can go on in these places, or has gone on in these places before human rights language came uh, from elsewhere. Um, uh, another point that uh, twelve scholars often make, uh, uh, twelve human rights scholars often make, uh, is to show uh, in detail the way in which global power. And I think power is essential to really to understanding. Uh, the career of human rights, the way that it circulates, the way that it shapes, and the way that it disciplines, right? Uh, without power being brought in, it's almost impossible to explain it adequately. So we, we try to show the way in which global power uh, shapes, inflects, deflects our understandings of when human rights has been violated, who the violated are, and who the violators are. 
One, for me, uh, one of the most powerful illustrations of this is with land reform in Southern Africa. I'm not from Southern Africa, but, but uh, for me, it's very powerful. The way in which the living human rights uh, law and, and the living human rights discourse characterizes, say, take uh, the most popular example of Zimbabwe, right? Uh, uh, all you hear is about the dispossession of white landowners in Zimbabwe. Almost nobody talks about the dispossession that led to the dispossession, right? <laughs> and, and any attempt to remedy the dispossession that led to this dispossession is, is dead on arrival. It's necessarily anti-human rights. It's problematic because there's this kind of manna from heaven that fell and conferred property rights on colonialists, right? Um, and, and for me, that's very deeply problematic and shows you the way in which human rights, not necessarily as text, but the way in which is actually dramatized and performed and acted upon uh, has this almost innate bias. And I'm not talking about human rights as concept. I'm thinking about human rights in, as reality the living uh, 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 human rights. Um, and, 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 and I'm taking time, but lastly, before I, I turn it over again to the, the moderator, um, another sort of uh, argumentative move or maneuver uh, that uh, 12 human rights scholars often uh, make is to show how um, the, the actual living expression of human rights or international, uh, 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 the living international human rights law uh, is riven with hypocrisy. It's characterized by hypocrisy. Uh, so for example, before our very eyes in, in the last two, three years, we have a, a, ma a massive refugee crisis, right? But the crisis is not actually because there's a crisis of suffering in the third world. The crisis is because of a projected suffering or perhaps reduction in standard of living if all these people enter Europe. That's the characterization of the crisis. The crisis is as if there was no crisis until people started crossing the Mediterranean, right? That's, that's the way in which the discourse uh, proceeds. And the, the human rights of these migrants somehow is not accounted for, somehow does not score on the register, right, of human rights. Uh, it does not soften European sovereignty. But can you take away migration, put a third world country, and put democracy, right? Imagine making an argument that because of the sovereignty of Cote d'Ivoire, that they are not subject to respecting human rights, right? But when it comes to migration, sovereignty hardens. This is the same sovereignty that until recently, we were told was so over, was passé, right? State sovereignty is now malleable, it doesn't really exist, but once European interests get challenged or perceptions of European interests, all of a sudden, sovereignty reappears in, a, in the hardest possible form, right? And all that. So, so these are the kinds of. I just want to, you know, give you a garden variety, so to speak, of the kinds of arguments that will human rights scholars make. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, your mentioning of the so-called refugee crisis reminds me of um, Susan Marx and her call on us international lawyers to maybe look at how international law plays a part in planned misery instead of talking like our German politicians now do about root causes which we might tackle through development aid which then might prevent refugees from coming to, to Europe. Um, so Louis and, and, and Obi already talked a bit about we have to look at the reality of international law. So for years now you have been insisting that we we'll have to look at the operations of international law in the everyday, especially in the post-colony, if we want to learn something about international law. So what do we learn, maybe in particular about international economic law, if we look at its operations in the everyday? Uh, thank, thanks, uh, Isabel, and thanks, um, um, organizers, for having us all here. Uh, I imagine that many of the members of the public that for the first time uh, uh, heard this um, 
rubrical uh, third world approaches to international law are all thinking that we are all mad. Um, but just let me tell you that when we have private meetings, we have lots of lots of fun, and um, and yeah, we um, you know. <laughs> The conversation never stops. Um, and, and I just want to continue on that line that the conversation never stops. And, and I'm going to try to take you somewhere else uh, with it. Um, so as, as you all have witnessed over the course of the afternoon, um, critical international lawyers, in particular those of us that try to, many of us come or try to think constantly about the global south, the south generally, uh, we're really um, kind of, um, constantly and, and in a, um, upset and angry about what international law did in the past and what it continues to do today. Uh, normally when that critique is put on the table, when that critique is put on the table, uh, we, uh, by fault, uh, but we normally try to explain it and our audience, you this afternoon, uh, tend to think that when international law does something, it does it in the ways in which normally international law is imagined to do things. So when we mention international law, you immediately have images of what international law is. So immediately you think about uh, the UN or the World Bank or the um, International Monetary Fund, or you think about uh, an international court, the International um, um, international Criminal Court or the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, or you think about human rights, yeah? And in particular, you think about those gross violations of human rights. International law exists there, or it should exist there. So we immediately uh, want to, um, uh, we make this link between uh, spaces of international law and this thing. Um, and, and, and as you reflect about that idea or the aesthetics that accompanies international law, you immediately will think, come to the realization that international law normally is thought as this uh, language, uh, this uh, body of norms and institutions that are extremely powerful, but they only exist in very small spaces. Okay? And in my work over the course of uh, several years, I've been trying to say that that, that is, is correct. Uh, international law exists in the IMF, in the World Bank, uh, in the UN, in the General Assembly. It exists or should exist when we talk about uh, or think or try to fight against uh, gross violations of human rights. But also international law exists everywhere. And exists everywhere for the very same reasons that uh, Macau, uh, Tony, Obi, Celine, uh, have been mentioning, because international law has a structure, the world in which we live in, all the way through, all the way through. There are many ways to get to that, um, to, to, to uh, prove that claim, but just only think about the very little spaces that exist today in the planet that are not regulated by national states, okay? So we are um, around eight billion people, and we all, these eight billion human beings, are being regulated in one way or another by national states. A very few number of those states were original states, Germany, the first of them. When you think about the, West, the Treaty of Westphalia that Antonio was making today, the forms were originated here, but that claim expanded throughout the world. And the national state form became to be the dominant political administrative unit that ended up regulating life across the planet. Now, if you take that as your starting point to think about international law, that international law is about small spaces, but international law is somehow everywhere, you have to, yes, once again, think about those smaller spaces where international law, continue, international law continue to exist, but then you need to change at least your modality of thinking about international law, what it does in three levels. You need to change the scale, you need to change the position in which you think about international law, and you, think you need to think about or change about the intensity of the dramas that are unfolded by international law. Okay, so in terms of a scale, we should get down from up above in the sky, in the, uh, the General Assembly of the United Nations, and then you go to go at the, uh, at the um, ground level. In terms of position, you should not just always think about international law in those cases where there are gross violations of human rights. You need to try to think about all of those 
micro dramas that end, has been ended up uh, marking the life of pretty much all the global south, you will say, but also increasingly the people of the global north. And similarly, you need to change intensity. You shouldn't just get upset, or we shouldn't get only upset, when they, um, they, there's blood. A, friend, um, a good friend of, a colleague of all of us, Rob Knox, says that when we think about human rights, we think about two types of hands, both of them black. Either they are black hands up above asking for money, or they are black hands waving, saying, yes, we got human rights. Okay? They, they, we need to change the intensity. We need to think about other ways in which international law continue to do a huge amount of work in a bad way at different intensity. So with that as a preliminary note, I would like to take you somewhere else. So, and, and it's a very quick reflection about uh, a work that I've been doing recently, and, and I think that will help us to give a, a little bit of a much more kind of a tactile sense of the kind of intervention that we're trying to do uh, in 12 today, uh, is particularly when we think about kind of the broader operation and effects of international law. So in, the, in my most recent work, I've been trying to think about um, the, this discourse called the security and development discourse. Uh, after the S September 11th, security enter, the question of security enter very strongly into the developmental agenda. And the World Bank started to say, if we want development in the Global South, we need to promote security, okay? And many countries, as you can imagine, in the Global South have been forced to take up that um, agenda. <laughs> uh, so, um, so the country that I've been uh, trying to understand uh, how it has responded to it has been uh, Colombia, where I'm uh, originally coming from, uh, when I'm originally from. And, um, and, and not simply just Colombia, but as most, um, as well, it's a big city, a four million uh, people city in the uh, south, uh, east, uh, southwest part of Colombia, and the name of the city is Cali, maybe some of you know, because it's the, the world capital of salsa, it's a fantastic city, hot, extremely diverse, um, quite progressive. Um, and, and this city, like many other cities in the global south, is trying to do the best that it can to globalize, yeah? It is, a city that, it is a city that is part of a country that has gone through several rounds of a structural adjustment uh, that started when Colombia was set up as a national state and continue today through forms of intervention orchestrated by everyone, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, and the private, uh, uh, private uh, financial system. Uh, and so this city is trying to do the best what it can, and, but it has a problem. It's one of the most violent cities in the world, one of the, mo the, the most, uh, f uh, f it's in the top of the 50 most violent cities in the world. And most of the crime committed in the city, um, not surprisingly, is committed by black Colombians, black African Colombians. Uh, so the city in now late, you know, late liberal times uh, is, um, is trying to respond in the way that it is, um, in the best possible way, you know, through developmental interventions. And what it's doing is setting up these really uh, interesting experimental frameworks to bring these black kids into the official life of the city. And I hope everyone is following me, okay? So, and the idea is that if this, these kids enter into the official life of the city, the security and development nexus will be a virtuous one, okay? City gets more secure, kids get developed, we are all win-win, and then we're going forward, the idea is, we're going all forward really strongly into the realm of globalization, and Cali will be a developed city, contributing to the development of Colombia and contributing to the development of the world. Now, the problem is, um, and uh, before that, I was gonna say something, and I, then I will say the problem. So, when you look at the, at the programs that the city has been implemented, those programs has two, Two phases, two phases. On the one hand, some of the money that the city has been using to uh, uh, attack crime in the city has been putting money into modernizing the police force. The other, uh, um, and as you can imagine what kind of intervention is that, uh, security cameras, so on and so forth. The other part of that, that intervention has been uh, spending money on development programs targeted to these kids. And those programs, those development programs for the kids have themselves two phases. On the one hand, those programs are 
in a very revolutionary way, are trying to offer some jobs to these kids to enter into the official life of the city by doing kind of mega environmental work or helping in the running of the public transport system of the city. On the other hand, yeah, so it's work, great. It's kind of re the return to pioneerial times, fantastic. On the other hand, the city is um, doing something that has been used for a long time in the Global South, that is psychosocial intervention to these kids, trying to teach them that the problem of uh, them being violent is because they're coming from families that are distracted, um, they don't have a very good solid value system, so on and so forth. Now, the problem of this uh, story that I'm telling you here about is that even though, even though Cali is a progressive city, even though it doesn't want to do the kind of Philippines Duterte technique of killing the kids, even though it's really trying to best that they can do with human rights, even though it's trying to behave the best it can with the multilateral bank and with the international public bank, the city doesn't have enough money, okay? So the city offers some jobs Lots of psychosocial therapeutic treatment to these kids. But the queue is too long. The queue is always too long. Some of those kids manage to get the jobs, but the large majority of them, the large majority of them, they never get there. I'm interested in my work with that kind of drama. How we, how we deal with that, how we deal with the broken hopes of those kids that never, ever, whatever we do, are gonna get in. That is the drama of the, the, the Global South. That is the drama of the Global South. Wherever you go, the queue gets longer, the promise gets bigger, countries in the Global South try to behave well, they want to behave well, it doesn't get there. I, I think when we think that in my uh, own work, when I think about the everyday operation of international law, that's what I kind of um, spaces that I want to take my readers, and uh, it's a great opportunity that I can take. I was able to take you there. Thank you, um, Celine. You wanted to come in, or that's too long ago now? I just wanted to cover, so I, I wanted to cover quick, because um, I, I just thought of it when um, uh, Obi was talking about uh, human rights and the problems of human rights, and I just wanted to link that with international economic law and the problematic nature of, of, of the construction of legal norms under international uh, economic law. So I wanted to bring up this idea of business uh, and human rights. Okay, so in the last few years, there's been a resurgent interest in this uh, concept of business and human rights, you know, um, making business uh, uh, attend to these human rights, complicit, um, you know, uh, accountable, oblige, you know, uh, placing obligations on businesses for human rights compliance, right? So there's this whole thing about uh, 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 socially responsible investments and then bringing human rights, uh, holding multinational companies to account for how they treat people in their operation, right? And then while you have this kind of, so that's a parallel process that's going on in the human rights regime, okay? And then on the, on the other side, you have these, what I've spoken about earlier, these international investment treaties that also happen in parallel. Right, um, and the notion of investment, treat, uh, investment uh, international investment law is based on this notion that the state must be held um, to account uh, for the promises that the state makes. So this is one of the fundamental. When I talked about myths earlier, this is one of the fundamental myths that is, you know, constantly being peddled and reinforced. That you have to, you know, like Louis said, you have to be a good state. You have to be a good citizen. And if you're a good citizen, you have to respect contracts. When you make a promise to somebody, you have to respect that. And so this, that's where the the, the underlying. This is very very simplifying the notion of legitimate expectations under international investment law. But effectively, that's it. You know, when you make a promise to a foreign investor, you really should and. They they come into your country and they invest, um, then you have to uphold that promise, right? That's a promise to the investor, the, the, the state makes to the foreign investor. But then there's this other aspect of like, what about the promises that the state has made to its own citizens, right? In terms of 
uh, environmental protection, um, in terms of um, universal health care, um, access to land, uh, promises to indigenous peoples that it will protect their livelihoods and access to land within a certain area, right? And so this is where I think the human rights dimension um, you know, um, comes in because you have this parallel process of trying to make you know, businesses more socially responsible, adding the human rights dimension, saying, okay, you have to consider the human rights of communities within. But then actually the problem isn't that. You, that was a parallel system that was started up in terms of trying to rehabilitate the problems that were starting with international investment law, which has this notion that the foreign investor is, is, it, it has primacy over everybody else. And it's the same when you look at debt crisis, right? So when you say things like, you know, in an austerity, say, oh, we don't, we don't have money to pay pensions of uh, you know, our, our pensioners, because we owe this money to, because, you know, we have to be a good citizen, because, the, the, you know, otherwise Moody's and all these rating agencies will downgrade us, right? So we have to pay our debts, because it's contract and commitment, this narrative of contract and commitment, I explore that in one of my uh, papers in 2014. I talk about this, like, you know, this narrative of contract and commitment is very, very strong. So you have to meet your obligations to your financiers, but then what about the pensioners? who in most cases is not free money. You know, people pay into the system their entire lives. When there's a debt crisis, how come the promises that a state makes to its creditors and its contract over tr uh, trumps um, everything else that the state has made? So there is, like um, Macau was saying earlier, um, and I, I really like this, we have no better language um, in politics and law to talk about a better tomorrow. And I think that's the problem, you know, with international economic law, somehow you cannot integrate it. That's where human rights then becomes a conduit and, and uh, you know, a substitute for our inability within international economic law to think about alternatives to the sort of norms and principles that we enforce through international economic agreements. Yeah, and maybe one may add that it's not just that international economic law calls on states to keep their promises and value their contracts, but that somehow law has a tendency of becoming more binding in the periphery than at the center, and that it's easily, more easily broken at the center without repercussions. You wanted to add something. Yeah, um, just, just to add quickly that I agree, of course, and um, uh, it's to point out, I mean, this is uh, one of uh, the key points that Bakshin, of course, makes, uh, you know, uh, uh, in his work, the way in which, although uh, human rights is then sort of posited and offered as the, the intervention, the thing to ameliorate uh, what international economic law but, but is doing, but, in national, but human rights itself is already constrained, yeah. right, in almost internally by the same economic logic, yeah. right? So that, I mean, he, he has this thing of the trade-related, market-friendly human rights, and the, the good state now uh, is increasingly being viewed as the state that is friendly to foreign capital, right? That is the good state. That's the progressive third world state, or any other state. But as, <laughs> as has just been pointed out, the, the impact is disproportionate to, to third world, third world uh, countries, again, because of power. We have to, that power asymmetries are key to, to the analytic here. Uh, and, 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 and so the progressive third world state, because progressivism is measured not as much by, by your breaking promises, although that's there too, uh, to your own citizens, uh, but much more fundamentally and much more impactfully by breaking promises to foreign investors and the IMF and the World Bank. That's yeah. what gets you in real deep trouble. And it's you can get along by breaking promises, human rights promises to your people, but the moment you break it to the IMF, you're dead. But it's also about the enforcement mechanisms, which I yeah. think Isabel mentioned yeah. earlier about the, the fact that, you know, when in international economic um, agreements, the dispute settlement, the enforcement mechanisms of a state's obligations under international law are much more forceful than the sanctions or non in, in, in terms of international human rights law. And that is not by accident that mm -hmm. that has happened, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
So I just wanna, um, a couple of points, one um, yeah, current and one historical. So the, 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 the current one, uh, I don't know if anyone uh, here or some of the people in the public have come across uh, with the uh, most recent book by uh, James Ferguson, uh, a very well-known anthropologist uh, who uh, at some point wrote The Anti-Politics Machine, uh, kind of a critical history of, of development. And in this um, recent book, Give Man a Fish, uh, he tries to understand um, uh, cash transfers, uh, um, minimal income, uh, experiments in South Africa and Namibia. Fantastic book, fantastic book. He's trying to kind of understand what is the positive impact of that and what is kind of the sociality that is coming from those exercises. But he starts with the, the book with a very um, chilling uh, fact. Uh, in an interview with uh, someone from the stock exchange uh, in uh, South Africa, um, the, the, the person working there said, uh, mentioned to him that, um, that if 20%, uh, 30% of the black population, unemployed black population of uh, South Africa disappears like this, the market wouldn't even respond to it because there's surplus population that is never, ever going to be integrated. Okay, never gonna be integrated in the system. The system is not gonna be able, the system was not able to do it. The system is not gonna be able to do it. The McKenzie, McKenzie think tank, if you want, if you want to believe on them, uh, um, uh, they say that uh, in the next few years, in particular from now till 2030, 800 million jobs are gonna be d disappearing. Okay, so the little jobs that they were in the south, they're going to increasingly be less and less and less because what the only new jobs that are going to be created are in the service industries, where I normally tend to be you know, uh, concentrated in the global north or in the sections of the north of the global south. So then the question is how do you, how do you industrialize, how do you modernize the economies in the global south? Because that's how the, the, the link to sovereignty, the link to exercise sovereignty is always have been, yeah, this is, this is clear for everyone apart from international lawyers, is always have been, link, been linked with economic power. This is, this, is, this is the secret behind the machine of Germany, for example, okay? So you need to have an industrial base that is able not only to give you cash, but also able to give jobs to the people which you then legitimize yourself. If you don't give jobs, it's gone. It's gone. That's why all the states in the global south have, gone, have been gone for a long time. Now, and here's my historical point. I recently um, concluded with the, in collaboration with many of the, um, the people that have been um, speaking today and some uh, people in the public, a, a large publication on the Bandung Conference. So for us trailers, the Bandung Conference is a wonderful, wonderful moment. So it's a conference that took place in Bandung, in Indonesia, in 1955, and it was the first the first ever, the first ever international conference organized by non-white people, okay? And that's re that was remarkable. It, re it required a huge amount of political organization and activism for many people across the world, the world to, for that to happen. Countries from Asia and Africa come together for the first time in history to decide the future. I learned two things from that. So the first one was that they wanted to present themselves exactly as Celine and I was mentioning before. They were good subjects, and they were even better subjects than the European national states. Like Rose Parfait put in her chapter, they were newer and truer subjects of international law. <coughs> Mad countries, crazy countries in Europe and the United States were engaged in a silly war called the nuclear war. And they were engaged in this thing called the Cold War. Countries in the Global South were trying to organize themselves and say, we need to be better. Second thing that I learned, they really tried to, and this is maybe the, was the problem, they swallowed the pill of development. They say, we need to industrialize ourselves because that's the way that we're gonna make real the sovereign promise. The problem was, that by 1955, the terms and conditions of international economic law had been already set, had been already set. So there was, after the Second World War, there was several institutions came out of the political arrangements at that time. The UN, the IMF, and the World Bank, and there had to be 
an organization for international trade. That organization was going to be decided or was decided in La Habana, okay, in 1947. However, in 1946, rich countries in the world, the global north countries, the European countries, in association with Australia, they wanted to arrive to Havana with a preset list of rules to be on the same page and not let third world countries to discuss, to discuss this nitty gritty where really things matter in economic terms. In 1947, Global North and Global South countries arrived to Havana. This, those agreements were already in place, so they say, let's get onto establishing an institution, and when that institution is there, we can maybe go and revisit those pre-agreements that we had established in 1946 in, La, in, in Geneva. Okay, we're gonna have an institution, we're going to have an, uh, discussions. We, we can behave and take political decisions like in the General Assembly. However, that institution that was going to be in charge of trade, that made the promise of regulate the international economic system, never came into being because the U.S. Senate blocked it. So what we ended up was with this preset rules of trade that have been already set before countries got into Havana. You can take it from there, and that's, a history, uh, that's what has come today. The impossibility, the true impossibility of countries in the global south to industrialize or to modernize their economies. Voila. <laughs> okay, somehow I wanted to use Bandung and your fascinating book um, co published with Vazuki Nizia and Michael Fakri as the transition to the part on utopian aspirations, <laughs> and now you destroyed it by telling this depressing story. <laughs> um, but still, in the introduction, you describe the significance of Bandung for international lawyers, um, lying in the fact that it was an act of collective imagination, a practical political project giving rise to institutional experiments and social movements. So I want all of you now to think, are there projects, moments in the course of decolonization which we could connect to, to reestablish faith in international law? Maybe Bandung was one such moment, the new international economic order might be such a project, and, and maybe Obi from your work now as UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and International Solidarity, in a way, could that be considered a continuation of projects of self-determination which bore um, yeah, some potential, or was was the door always already foreclosed, and is it now? And are we all in the third world now? But that's a, another question I would like to discuss more intensely if we had time, because I don't think this is necessarily a good way to put it. But okay, so, you're the king of Bandung. No, no. So let, let me start with Bandung and qualify what I just said. I mean, I, I just I, I, I let the punchline go too early. Um, <laughs> but so I'm gonna bring a kind of a theoretical um, apparatus here to try to engage with Bandung. So uh, a wonderful uh, post-colonial theorist, um, you know, that wrote a book called uh, Provincialized in Europe a few years ago. Um, he, he, he says, you know, how we understand the history of the world, okay, how, how we engage with this animal is called the history of the world. And then he said, you know, it's a very big topic and, you know, it's complicated and it's full of, uh, replete with uh, Euro Eurocentric views and narratives and mythologies. He said, but, well, what, one thing to start kind of dissecting this animal, or getting there, is to always, and, uh, to keep in mind kind of the Marxist premise, then uh, there are multiple histories, okay? And then he said, you know, there are at least, at least two histories. There's history one, and then it's history two, okay? And history one, say, is mainstream history. And it's a history that is installed in such a way that enables processes of accumulation and exploitation. But it's always, there's a history two, and history three and four and five and six. But there at least is a history two, of histories of resistance and tenacity 
and fights and care and love and friendship. And that, those two run always in parallel, okay? And I think Bandung, elements of Bandung itself, not Bandung, Bandung is not necessarily history too, all around, but elements of Bandung, the energy that went into it, the energy that came out of it, progressive energy that came out of it, is definitely belongs to history too. And that has been the history of international law all across, a dance between history one and history two, okay? Uh, so every time there has been a, and this is why we still believe some, I mean, I, I don't say believe, but it's still work in international law. It's not necessarily because we believe that there is an a, 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 a international law history too, that it's gonna be perfect, we're around the beautiful. No, we believe, we, we are engaged with it because if you don't engage with it, that history too disappears, gets more ephemeral, okay? So once again, Bandung is interesting because it teaches us, it shows us that the fight is important. Bamcho Obi, you are engaged on uh, kind of a, an ongoing band, Bandung effort to try and reformulate the terms of, and conditions of this, no? Yes. Um, perhaps by, I don't know, uh, maybe some of you might disagree, perhaps by nature I'm an optimist. I know I don't sound like that. Um, so uh, this is where sometimes I differ uh, with some of my uh, colleagues um, who, you know, who accuse me of being too optimistic, right? It's almost like I have this hope that co doesn't come out of my analysis <laughs> and all that. But, but indeed, it does come out of my analysis uh, as a, a wonderful segue, um, uh, Luis. Uh, as Luis just pointed out, I think that you know, Bandung obviously didn't achieve what it set out to achieve. But that's less the important thing than that, as you said, that it, it, it showed the value of trying, of, of, of fighting. And it's not as if the world in, you know, in 1955 is exactly the world today. I mean, you know, um, you know Malaysia resisted successfully. So you can map, you know, you can put on a ledger, uh, you know, all the unsuccessful, mm. you know, uh, 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 incidents, shall we say, of alterations of resistance and the successful ones. And, you know, you would have things in this column, right? The successful ones. So till this day, uh, Nigeria is a much weakened power than it was, say, in 1980 even, but it's still resisting the... the I uh, forget the, the EU trade pact, I forget the former name, still till today, and I'm surprised actually uh, uh, that almost every other African country has signed and is still resisting it, right? So, and Nigeria is not a particularly uh, <laughs> governed by a particularly radical or even whatever elite, right, uh, at this moment. So, um, so, so, so there, there are possibilities there. Right, I, 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 and, and, and I think that it's important, uh, I don't know if I'm answering a question that was asked, but it's important, uh, as Isabel sort of hinted uh, in, in uh, her message to us, to, talk, you know, to think about the way in which we can reimagine action, right? Resistance, okay? So uh, critical elements, for example, in my view, critical elements in the global north are, not to put too much of a stress on it, critical, key to, to in, in, in one dimension, that they're, they're key to moving the needle in a progressive way. Why do I say this, right? Um, Canada, uh, last year, or two years ago, did not just wake up one morning and accept 20,000 Syrians overnight. Right? I mean, there were, there's been decades of action, uh, you know, by, by Canadian refugee activists that prepared first the party that took over power just before that, uh, and the, the prime minister himself, when he wasn't even a member of parliament, in order to be in that mental, uh, uh, if you like, uh, to have that mentality that allows allowed him to take that 
something that even in Canada was still a political risk. We, yes, we still do have our own Trumpites. Uh, Canada is not some El Dorado. Uh, you know, you have people on the right wing who don't want uh, refugees to be taken and all that. So I think that that kind of internal softening, if you like, of the global North countries, it's important you know, to become, for them to become more receptive to resistance and protest and protestation from the global south, right? So you need those kinds of alliances. Now, I'm not uh, one of the complaints of global uh, critical uh, twill scholars is that such alliances are very quickly taken over by global north because of asymmetries of resources and all that, right? And, and um, global south activists, you know, always writing grants to fit a narrow Ford foundation sort of model because they want the money and they're doing the rational thing, right? But, but you can see possibilities. Now, how that plays out in, in, in actual practice remains to be seen. Um, and I think that for want of a better way of putting it, we need to end place in, in the places where these decisions are taken. And these are not just uh, you know, uh, uh, at the civil society level, but also, in my view, scaling up even to the UN uh, uh, level, right? Now, of course, we need to do so being extremely conscious, uh, even suspicious, of the inherent limits of such action. Yeah. So if you, if you were to go to the UN uh, and you thought that you could arrive at the UN and because you're so great, uh, there will be action, you know, the next five years on, on, on something, God help you. First, get your refund, right, of your travel cost, uh, you know, in good time, right? So, you know, <laughs> this is no, I'm not speaking in my UN capacity here. Uh, but, but what I'm trying to say is that the, the UN moves in, you know, small paces, and in increments, uh, and there are things you can do. Uh, and there are things you can't do, right? And you, we need to carefully map those. What can you do, what you can do? But what I mean by emplacement is, I would rather Louis <laughs> were in place in certain committees than some other people, even from Colombia. If you understand my point, the third world is not this place where everybody thinks like Louis or Macau or Tony Angui or Celine, you know, anybody, right? There is a diversity of perspective, right? And there are, I mean, uh, it was Chimney, uh, uh, B.S. Chimney that talks about the uh, transnational capitalist class. Some of them are from the global south, right? So not everybody <laughs> thinks the same way. So I would rather, uh, you know, Celine wasn't setting uh, uh, committees, and I've seen, I can't, of course, disclose any confidences, the difference it makes to have not even twelvers, but just critical interna other critical international lawyers on some of these committees, uh, UN bodies that I've sat, and I, I, it makes a, a lot of difference. Um, um, let me leave it at that for now. <laughs> Perhaps so it's maybe just to clarify, I was not just thinking about how to reimagine resistance, but also how to reimagine institutions and mm -hmm. whether there is actually scope today for some at least institutional experimentation, and if there is, which institutions should we experiment with to bring about um, a maybe more just global economic order? But of course, resistance mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe comes first. Mm -hmm so we get this scope. Um, yeah, um, so I think in terms of, um, uh, you know, the current institutions, and okay, I don't want to talk about the new international economic order so much, but it was one of those moments that the uh, developing countries, you know, felt that the political sovereignty did, uh, uh, you know, did not bring the independence um, and that you needed an economic sovereignty as well in order to, you know, achieve that full sovereignty. Of course, that was before they encountered 12 scholars, right, who upended the whole notion of sovereignty in the first place. Um, so I don't want to focus on that. What I wanted to do, actually, I was thinking about this. Um, 
It's about the representations, and I, I want to talk about the everyday resistance. I think I'll be really hit it on the head in, in, in the UN, you know, and all these in, institutions. And we forget, um, we always see the big fights, right? You know, like the Bandungs and, you know, like, uh, you know, the G77, you know, G77s, you know, articulations in these places. Um, but actually, what is, the fight is happening every day in these international organizations, you know? Um, diplomats and representatives from the South, from the Third World, um, fight these fights every single day. I call them the square bracket fights because that was my first entry into, uh, yes, Obi is laughing, right? For those of you who you know the UN system, you. Um, but it's the square bracket fight, right? Um, it was my first introduction to the processes at the UN, right? Where. Um, so developing countries we in this negotiating room and you know there'll be all these Americans and, and I was just struck. I remember the first time I went into one of these rooms, um, I was working for an NGO in the South and there was this really impressive Indian representative from a mission and she was really impressive. Like not just in terms of all these state people in like black dark suits, she was this bright vibrant lady with this you know sari and she was really impressive. And it was fighting over square brackets because as you know like texts in the UN drafts are never negotiated. Um, those that are, are still in contention, you know the, the wording of each document is put in square brackets, right? And these diplomats fight every day to put, make sure that those are in square brackets because we didn't agree to that because that's what the, uh, you know, like the more dominant states will insist. Oh yeah, we have already agreed in this wording. And it's always this fight about, you know, like no, we haven't agreed yet because we don't agree with this and it has to be in square brackets. And so I always call that the square bracket fight. And these are the things that diplomats are fighting and representatives are fighting and we forget these. These are the moments, this is the everyday international law. Um, it might not be in the post colony, but it's the representatives of the post colonies within these institutions that fight every single day and I'm always really impressed by it. And apart from that, it's also the other aspect to it and it's not just the elite fights, but also the resistance on the ground. So I'm talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right, the TBP. Malaysia, you see, okay, actually, ultimately, we signed. So we are a nation state, and it said, oh, well, Malaysia is signed up to the GPP. But actually, there was a huge fight, you know, within the country, internal to the country. Um, you know, there were politicians that were doing impact assessments. I think, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this too loudly because, um, but uh, uh, much better than the British government currently with the Brexit impact assessments. Shall I say that? I'm being filmed, so maybe I will have this on the Daily Mail, right? Like the. Um, uh, my face there, um, but but they do, but they did do that. They did, you know, NGOs collated. They did. The government, you know, like didn't spend a lot of time, but the, the the NGOs, the civil society, they did an impact assessment of line by line. They themselves decided what are the red lines when you go into a negotiation, right? What is the impact if we had this? What would be the impact on agriculture, on mining, on you know the the, the sectors of the economy, the services? So those were the things that were ha that are happening. They're not just you know like this these are everyday resistance that happens in the South, right, to international institutions by representatives of uh, 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 the South. And I think my other thing that I want to say, and before I shut up, uh, to rekindle a sense of possibility, somebody told me this, right, you know, like, you get so easily offended. Uh, this was something in relation to something else. You know, always take offense. And I said to myself, I, 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 got, I thought about this, and then I, I then wrote this person an email afterward, and I said, no, I want to take offense. You know, I will always continue to take offense. It's because when we stop taking offense, when we lose the sense of indignation and indignance and indifference, this is when the resistance stops. Um, because everybody was offended at some point. You know, like the independence, I mean, Gandhi was offended. Right? Mandela was offended. Rosa Parks was offended. Martin Luther King was offended. And we have to take offense. And we have to continue taking offense. Whether I'm, because, you know, there's the, that black, some of you might have heard about this black tie um, uh, charity philanthropic event that took place in London two days ago that, you know, all these philanthropists, business people were groping the hostesses. It was a men only event. So, Get, why are you offended? You know, a woman, right? So I want to take offense. I want to take offense when somebody says, oh, you know, you can't be here because you're a woman. You can't be here because you're um, uh, uh, not white. Um, you're a person of color. I want to take offense because the moment we stop taking offense is when the moment that resistance stops.
Thank you, Celine. That was on the point. Now it's 5.15, we have to end our panel. I have to apologize for a bit of a mismanagement of time. I would have liked to give you the opportunity to ask questions, but we have to end because in 15 minutes, there will be a very exciting artist's talk with Aeson Heraclito. So please be back in 15 minutes and until then enjoy the break. And thank you very much to the panelists um, for being here and talking with us.